Now, this gentleman right here who wrote, this gentleman right here, he wrote the Windows login cheat sheet, right? So you cannot do forensics. You cannot do investigations without a document that this gentleman right here produced. So I'm very proud to announce Mr. Michael Gu uh, from Austin, Texas, the great state of Texas. He's going to give us a keynote about um, what he has learned in the last 20 years. I'm sure this, this is going to be an amazing keynote. Uh, so take it away, sir. All right. Before you guys leave, I'm just keeping the, the theme of uh, malware on. So uh, thanks for all your hard effort. I'll give you these. And he's walking away, so he's not going to okay. I uh, just want to say what's on here. Uh, warning, this ad may contain malware. So uh, there you go. Well, then I know whatever you had. Morning, everybody. Oh, come on. Austin does better than that. Good morning, Miami. I guess maybe I should have said that for starters. <laughs> uh, compelling questions will be rewarded with uh, thumb drives. So, uh, you know, and Chris gets one. Chris gets one just because. Because he likes malware like I do. Uh, my name is Michael Goff. I do live in Austin, Texas, though I am from California, so great state of Texas. Yeah, not so much. Great city of Austin, yeah. And just to point out, Patrice now lives in Austin, so we stole one of your own. Um, sorry. <laughs> so how many people here have never heard of me before? Quite a bit, I'm guessing, because this is a new area for me. I haven't been down to Miami doing any presentations, and I do a lot of presentations. I was in Denver last week and actually saw a couple people in Denver and then besides Austin the week before. So, yeah, a lot of, for a lot of you, I'm, I'm going to be new. Um, as Rod said, I am the developer and creator of the Windows Logging Cheat Sheets. If you ever work with Windows, and I know a lot of us don't want to, but in the reality, our jobs require us to, or you are a red teamer, and you want to understand what your red teaming looks like on a box that's properly logged, then you need to know about these cheat sheets, okay? Uh, these were created basically as an outcome to me dealing with the Chinese APT attack uh, which I'm going to touch on in the course of the Prezo. Um, but these are free resources on malwarearchaeology.com that you can download. They're all PDFs. Uh, we, we even cover the file and registry auditing, so that way if you really want to see what kind of file drops there are when you detonate malware, uh, it's kind of what LogMD was built on, is, is kind of take these cheat sheets and then look for all the items. But we also have PowerShell and Splunk logging cheat sheet, and then this thing called the Malware Management Framework. Think of it as vulnerability management, just apply malware to it. I read reports from those like Chris and other malware researchers. I look for interesting artifacts, you know, what was interesting in WannaCry, and I say, am I looking for that already or not looking for that? And then I apply those to my defenses, and that's what that is. I'm also the co-creator of LogMD. Uh, LogMD is the log and malicious discovery tool. It's a logging tool that will check your system against the Windows logging cheat sheets, as well as uh, CIS benchmarks, USGCBs, Aussie cyber standards, etc. And it does a bunch of other malicious discovery items like hashing and registry snapshots, log versions. So yes, uh, I have done hackery. I have done red teaming. If you're interested in something interesting project I did, just uh, go to YouTube and, and look for card key exploit. This was not an RFID, right? The RFID, that's not what we exploited. We actually exploited the back end uh, controller and were able to open all the doors that are connected to the controller. There's a maintenance mode we took advantage of. And so, yes, I've been there. We met with the CTO, or the, actually the CEO. We sent them a letter. We uh, responsibly disclosed the, the vulnerability. Within six days, the CEO contacted us and said, how can we help? <laughs> sent us a whole new kit, a board and everything, that I created a little uh, buzzer type thing that we analyzed their changes. So I have done the red team stuff, so know that I've been there. I worked for HP, uh, North American Security Practice, for eight years. So uh, I, ha I had my, my dabbles in it. I've also broken a few security tools and contacted CTOs, uh, one of which is Tripwire, for example. I found a flaw of Tripwire that turns out it's design, and we were wondering why the Chinese never triggered Tripwire, and we figured out why, and uh, we called them and said, yeah, we need to tell you we found something. So in file integrity monitoring, if you do the system live and you drop a file in the box, uh, in theory, the file integrity monitor is supposed to record that that file was dropped. In reality, they sample it about every 10 seconds. So if you can drop malware, detonate malware, delete malware off the box, Tripwire is never going to see it, for example. I, I assume many of the file integrity solutions have a similar, similar problem. So I love making these calls because I get to tell people how their stuff's broken. I met with uh, people at IBM. I said, hey, I got a flaw I found with Big Fix, but I can also use Big Fix to find the flaw and fix it. So that was kind of cool. And it's on their list to fix, but I'm not sure they ever have. It involves Unicode. Um, and again, I'm the worst and best kind of customer. 
because I will actually test your stuff, and I'm going to talk about that a bit in my Prezo. So you can fix your stuff, okay? One of the things I can't stand is, is these vendors, you know, they spew all the stuff to you, you test their products, and you find some really obvious, glaring things. Share it with them. They will not improve their products unless you share it with them. So my 20 years, I've done a lot of crap. Anybody here Nobel C&E at any point in their time? Yeah, okay. We're old. The rest of you aren't. That's how that works. I used to work for a company called Vanstar. It was the largest bar in the world until they bought somebody else, accrued so much debt. Fortunately, I had left just before, and they closed their doors. Yes, I'm old. I designed uh, the NT4 desktop for when I worked at Microsoft as a contractor uh, for Intel. So I spent a year at Intel designing their NT4 stuff. That was a very interesting experience. Uh, one company that takes security very seriously. I worked in Y2K tobacco litigation for a healthcare company. I was big brother of a bank in Utah until Wells Fargo bought us, which sent me off to HP Consulting for eight years. So I've gotten around. I then left HP after the EDS acquisition and went to work for the Texas Comptroller. Anybody ever hear of the Texas Comptroller's data leak where we lost seven and a half million records? I'm the poor bastard that found it. They fired my boss, fired the head of IT, and then made me boss. So what did they just teach me? If I find something, you're fired. So I left because that just didn't make any sense to me. I then went over to the uh, short stint in a, game, in a cloud company, and then I went over to the gaming company where I unfortunately had to deal with the Chinese on almost a monthly basis. And when I say almost monthly, I mean something got compromised them by them, either the entire environment or a single or multiple systems every flipping month, except for around Chinese New Year's, which they didn't do anything. I learned a lot there. Everything I thought I knew got applied when I was in the gaming industry. It was a serious wake-up call for everything that I had talked about with people, everything I learned at HP, everything I taught our clients, everything I was trying to teach our own consultants at HP, and I actually had to apply it. It's a big wake-up call. I had a stint with a financial company, helping them set up with some security stuff as well, and uh, a cloud company. And now I'm in healthcare and higher ed. Uh, that is a SaaS provider. We, we develop applications and crunch their data and help them save lots of money, retain students, things like that. In far, as far as community, I did spend one year at ISSA as a VP. My plan was to become president, but then B-Sides came to town. Uh, we didn't know much about it at that point in time. This was, uh, so what, six, seven, eight, nine years ago. And I said, well, wait a minute. B-Sides is a, kind of a big deal now. It's the community for the community. So I left the ISSA board to run B-Sides Texas. Uh, B-Sides Texas was four cons. We were the largest entity of the B-Sides groups. Uh, Michelle and I ran the uh, LLC, uh, myself running the company itself, and my wife did the books. And I ran the two-day Austin Con, the rest of the cons were one days. And we had Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas. Uh, really great experience, a lot of fun. Um, and as those who put on this con, um, something you should definitely look into. And then also, Mauer Archaeology was something I found, uh, something I wanted to get back to the community. I wish everybody knew this, because I used to teach blogging at, at HP, and I wanted everybody to kind of know What's the number one question I get asked? What do you say? Thus, the cheat sheet got created. And then based on that, dealing with the Chinese, wanting a tool that does certain things, you know, red shot, GUI, can't really deploy that with a command line. I wanted a tool that allowed me to analyze malware quickly, basic analysis, not deep analysis. Uh, basic analysis, get the artifacts I need, uh, be able to look at a Windows box very quickly, identify if it's compromised or not. So we developed a tool called LogMD. So my 20 years, I've done, I've done a lot. Um, Spoke earlier of the WinNTI stuff, so in 2012, I joined about three months before this attack started, and then the following year, Kaspersky in April 2013 put this report out about the WinNTI group attacking the uh, Chinese. Um, we found it nine months before, so I got there, I think, in April. It hit us in June. So talk about, you know, hey, jump in the fire. Uh, fortunately, a friend of mine, the one that got fired at the Texas Comptroller for uh, basically disclosing the, the data leak, uh, was the one that got in there, bought a bunch of products, implemented them all, and said, hey, I need a lot of help. We, we're constantly being pounded here. Uh, you want to come over here and, and have some fun? I'm like, yeah, let's fight the Chinese. Isn't that great? Sounds like, sounds like a blast. Yeah, not really, but it was fun. Um, and there I developed the concept of the malware management framework. So you're in an environment. What do you look for? Well, the idea is, if I read a report from, say, Chris, who's going to speak later today, um, or any other researcher, Mandiant guy, and I find some unique thing about WMI or PowerShell, or some registry key. I take that and go, I'm not watching for that. And I look at the tool sets I have and I say, how can I look for this condition? And I'll talk about the tool set uh, later. Um, but that's basically what it was. Look at the reports, pull out the interesting artifacts, which by the way, I'd really like the bitch at the AV and, and 
by our industry for not making a clear, concise, these are good artifacts. They always put those stupid MD5s at the end, which are worthless to me, because we all know APT is, you know, every, every hash is different. Um, but they should stick out to us. I shouldn't have to read a paragraph and go, oh, that's interesting. It, it installed the service. It should be very obvious to us. So I wish they'd improve on that. And I validated in the course of 2012 that uh, logging is badass blue team. Okay? That's another thing I learned. In 2014, uh, they provided, uh, again, we provided a well-known IR firm. Uh, I, won't, I won't pick on them because they're really good 99.9% .9 of the time. This was their off day. Uh, they had been acquired. You probably know who it is now. Um, and they basically probably were shorthanded that day or week. We gave them this thing. So we gave them an infected VM with the 2014 WinNTI stuff. They came back and said it was clean. Your VM is nothing on it. We proceeded then to walk them through what was infected on the VM and completely blew their minds. So, yeah, um, I think at that point uh, we were just like, man, oh, man, oh, man. Um, and I think at that point we had graduated to the top of our class. Woohoo! We're better than XYZ company uh, for that day or week, right? Um, I, I'm good friends with a lot of them. They have some mad skills. So it really has to do with whether they've seen this particular attack type before and whether or not their automated process of, of detecting or looking for it before they put a, an actual engineer on it um, will find it. So in 2014, these guys hid their payloads in the registry, uh, in their scripts, in their calls. They basically just encrypted them and dropped them in a certain key in a couple of places, different boxes. And basically, we see that as being called fileless malware today. Uh, to me personally, it's just clever malware. I don't think it's a file list because the registry is a database. The database is a file. Files on the box. So you have to think about how can I find these? Well, one of the things based on this attack we had put in LogMD was the search for large reg keys because there aren't many large reg keys in a box. Okay, you literally have about 20 of them, and half of those are duplicated because you've got each key current user, each key users, so they're identical keys. You whitelist those out, and you can check your entire enterprise for large reg keys. And it's a wonderful thing if you're looking for this kind of fileless, or, or as the vendors call it, fileless. Uh, there was a podcast, Breaking Down Security. Any Breaking Down Security listeners here? Woohoo! Uh, if you listen to the Fileless Malware podcast I was on a week ago or so, uh, please listen to Breaking Down Security. They have a good variety of guests. Dave Kennedy's been on it, and I've been on it. Um, some good content, uh, very variety in the, in the people. Brian Betcher, their co host, is actually co, co founder of LogMD as well. And so we put these kind of artifacts that we find into the tool log and me. That's how we, we look at it. The other thing they did is they modified um, the management tools. So they modified the McAfee framework service as well as the big fix client helper service. They borked it. The hash changed, right? Dead giveaway. But how many people here would think that they would modify the actual management binaries, your compliance or soft, software patching tool and your AV tool to actually read the registry, encrypt the payload, drop it on disk where a service had been called, that was already sitting there pointing a fake uh, empty file to actually pop the box. I mean, that's just kind of, that's something I would secondarily say, yeah, I'm going to look for that first. No, I would look for that last. Uh, but fortunately, because of the way we caught them, uh, which I'll show you a screenshot of, it kind of led us to that, to that conclusion. And, of course, they used a service to load that binary once the management tool dropped it from the registry. So uh, kind of cool. So my thoughts about the InfoSec industry. Where are we today? InfoSec is like many other industries. The automotive industry, right? Crash. Uh, first, we started with cars with no seat belts, and we got seat belts. Then we got collapsible steering wheels, airbags, dual airbags, multiple airbags, crash barriers, yada, yada, yada. So that industry, like ours, has actually evolved, right? Or we are evolving as well. The airline industry also went through an evolution. I was in aerospace when the first two of these went down, so when I flew, I was, I was pretty white knuckled because I know I can fail on these things because I used to make the parts. And in this case, the rudder had locked, and it caused the plane, depending on the pilot's uh, uh, reaction, would flip upside down and then, of course, into the ground. And three of those had to go down before the airline industry acknowledged this is a problem. So InfoSec is very similar to that. So where are we with, with this evolution? Um, do people really have to die or breach first? Well, you know, you got Anthem. I was stuck in that one. I froze my credit. It, it, how many people here freeze their credit? If you don't, you really should. 30 bucks, and you have to unfreeze it when you need to apply for credit, uh, worth their weight in gold. So are we at seatbelts? Where are we at with MSEC? This is a discussion we can have in the next two days as you think about it and move forward with your career. Where are we actually at? Is compliance our seatbelts? Is that the first step, right? The first real thing that we saw with, with security is compliance. So we know these are all humongous breaches, 
and they all, in theory, were doing compliance. So maybe seatbelts aren't enough for us. I don't know. We are still very earlier evolution, right? It is still management's lack of acceptance of why we aren't really there yet, right? Do we have a real perceived value? We're, we're basically considered cost over to them. So we have to basically convince them, or are they going to have to die like these companies do? That's the question. So let's talk about some career thoughts. I know we have some uh, children here. we got probably some young ones. How many people are just starting out in the tech? Oh, I'm like this old guys. Okay, so here's some advice for you guys. Blue team, baby. I know some of you are going to groan. You can boo and hiss. That's okay. That, that gives the crowd a sense of what the mix is here. 80% of the jobs are blue team related. Sorry, that's just the reality. Um, you know, a lot of us say we, we want to be red teamers and everything. We start out, we want to be red teamers. We think it's cool. We think it's sexy. Uh, but the reality is, um, you know, you have to you have to end up getting a job in blue team. You may do some side red teaming, but for the most part, blue team maybe. It does rock. And some people even say uh, you can't be a blue teamer until you're red team. I'm going to disagree. The jobs, the amount of jobs that are out there will reinforce that. I think in the course of you evolving as a blue teamer or as a console monkey, as I call them, people that are just you know, working the EPO console or whatnot, you will start to learn, and I will start to mentor you. That's what you know. I have people I mentor and try to try to get them to do better in what they do. And that's what we have to do is we have to mentor people so that we don't have to say this anymore or believe this anymore because it really is not true. We don't have the time to get every blue teamer on the planet, red team them first to become a blue teamer. We can teach them. They can have roles. They can have functions within our, with our environments. No problem. And as you return, as you mature as a red teamer, a blue teamer, you will do some red teaming. You will have to look at something and say, hmm, why is this getting compromised, right? What caused this to occur? What are they taking advantage of? You know, DLL side loading. How is that DLL loading in the Windows directory? Ah, when I log into Explorer, it side loads the DLL all the way it goes, right? And then, of course, the typical pen testing mentality, red teaming, and blue teaming mentality. How does this work, right? So I think as a part of blue teaming, you will do some red tasks, but you no longer have to be a red teamer to be a blue teamer. Blue teamers can, right out of the box, start being good. Now, if we look at the jobs, thanks uh, to Dave Foote, um, I was at Rocky Mountain InfoSecCon, and Dave did this presentation. He was ripping through these slides, and I'm like, can I borrow those? Can I have those? Because that's, like, perfect. Now, these are job titles just in general of, of what's here. Um, again, notice all the job titles, and notice there's only one red team. And in here, same thing. you got a bunch of jobs. There's a GAC, pen tester, another pen tester. Uh, but again, all certifications are around blue team. And again, we have three of them on here. We've got the EU involved, but again, blue team with a couple of red teams. So the jobs really are in blue team. Sorry, but that's just the reality. And most of those red team jobs are probably in consulting. Here. So getting started in InfoSec. If I hear I want to be a pen tester or a red teamer one more freaking time, yeah. A word of wisdom to the students, noobs, and I know there's some students. Rod uh, had me wait specifically to address them, and, and of course the wannabes. If you're, uh, just, you know, if you're destined to be a red teamer, yeah, you're probably already doing it. That's the reality. That's the mentality of how red teaming works. It's kind of built into our red team mentality. I got started freaky. I had a really big, expensive phone bill, and I set out to figure out how to make long-distance phone calls for free. That's how I got started. With this. A little box. My dad says, "What's that?" I'm like, "Oh, it just plays music when someone's on hold." Yeah. It did much more than that. Or when they put a lock on the uh, dialing phone in the garage so they can get a hold of me after school when I was in the garage, it had a lock on number one. Yeah, they didn't know that. One, 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 one was a four. One, 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 one was a seven. One, yeah, they didn't know that. So I learned really quickly how to hack because I used what I had. It's kind of built into the red mentality, right, to automatically be a self-starter, right? And you have to be incredibly curious. You can't come out of school and say, I'm going to be a red teamer. Yeah, you'd already been. So you better start now. You better get a mentor. You better get somebody to uh, help you out, guide you, lead you the way. So if you're not doing it, you're probably too late, or it's going to be an uphill battle because you're really going to have to be a good ninja to, to prove it. I asked three questions every time. And besides Austin, I was there, and I was talking to somebody I was talking to earlier, and he was next to a, a female, and I like to get the females encouraged. You don't see a lot of them. So I'm like, hey, how you, how'd you hear about this stuff? I don't see you here before. I'm a student out of school. Uh, I'm like, what do you want to be? And guess what she said? A red teamer. So I asked her my first question, which I ask all of you. It should be an obvious answer by now. 
What is the number one thing I would use to catch a red team or pen tester or hacker? Any guesses? There we go. Log data. Uh, log data is the right answer. How do you compile a Linux binary? Binary. Oh, she just stared at me like she I didn't she didn't have any clue what I was talking about. Okay. What distro? Do you have to have GCC? I mean, come on, people. If you're a red teamer and you're going to be a pen tester, you got to answer these questions. And of course, are you seriously good at documentation? Right? If you don't do these three questions right off the top of the bat, you can't rip those out. I, I, my interview's over with you. There's no way you're going to be a pen tester or a red teamer on my team because you should already have known that or been taught that. And again, I'm not going to teach you how to hack. You got to find a mentor or better yet, volunteer. I talked to a class at UT last year, University of Texas in Austin, big university. You'd think they'd have a clue. 75 students or so. Matt Tassaro was the adjunct professor. He's the OWASP Life CD uh, author and maintainer. You know, works full time at OWASP. And I asked him the questions, you know, how many people have been to a B-Sides event? Okay, I ran B-Sides for six years in Austin. <laughs> and none of them had been to one of my B-Sides. So I'm just like, oh, this is really bad. Your instructors are awful. Now, I'd retired when I talked to Matt's class, so he knew I wasn't running it anymore. So then I offered free B-Sides Austin, uh, because I still have a poll, obviously. If you just write a two-page essay of why you wanted to be an InfoSec and what you wanted to do and how you found it interesting, two-page. Zero submissions. Talk about fail. I would not have hired a single one of them. This is the state of a lot of our colleges and universities, right? We complain about developers not coming out with secure development. How about people that are in the InfoSec program? These are juniors and seniors who five knew that they wanted to be in some vertical and 70 are like, I don't know. Man, I don't know if it's a millennial thing or not. You have to ask the millennials around you about that one. So getting started, you have to be curious. You have to seek the knowledge. All of us in this room, this doesn't apply just to the noobs. This applies to anybody who wants to change roles, right? I was a Nobel c &E. The reason I was a Nobel c &E is I used to do engineering and CAD equipment. The drawings got too big for floppies. We started networking this stuff together. I'm like, oh, cool, there's a, there's a lot of people buying this stuff. So I went into the networking side. Ooh, there's routers in the internet. Ooh, this can't end well. So I went into that. And I basically evolved into security before it was an industry, right? I had the curious and I sought out that knowledge. I'm not sure the Nobel certification was uh, the right thing to do, but hey, at the time. At the time, I was also an MCSC for NT351. Yeah, I'm old. You have to seek out and attend community events. I was shocked that none of them knew about ISSA or IC squared or NASEG or AHA or 512, whatever your equivalent is here. Ours is, you know, Austin awesome Hacking Anonymous or 512 group, right? Um, you have to seek them out. You have to help people seek them out. Okay? You have to help the students seek them out. Volunteer for the classes is what I would say. Go talk to the professors. You also have to seek out conferences and ask for scholarship. There's this 15-year-old kid a couple years ago, actually not three years ago, he's probably pushing 18 and getting ready to go to college now, where he stood up in a room of about 300 people, stood up and asked a question in front of all these InfoSec guys. I'm like, dude, you got some cojones. And the fact that he did that, I offered him and gave him a scholarship and got him into B-Size Las Vegas for free, and we got him a DEF CON pass as well. If you show some conumption, we are some gumption, we are going to reward you if you can show your worth. Seek out. Again, you have to seek out and present at local conferences and proving grounds. If you think what I'm doing right now is fun, and you think you can get it in front of people, and you want to prove yourself, you want to be a thought leader, you actually have to, you know, someone else has to say you're a thought leader. You can't decide you're going to be one. So quit doing that. But there are proving ground talks at a lot of conferences. Seek them out and Proving grounds. It's not a big crowd. You'll get mentored. And it's a wonderful thing if you want to advance your career because management leadership is going to require you to talk to people. Some of us don't like talking to people. You're going to have to. So work trends. Well, again, we lack resources, right? Shortfall, 1.5 million cyber... I don't drink. I can't, I can't have booze, so I'll just fake drink. Cybersecurity professionals, right? 209,000 cybersecurity jobs in the U.S., right? 75% uh, of the postings... Um, again, a thousand top-level cybersecurity experts globally, but we need like 10,000. So there's a shortage. A lot of those are console monkeys and whatnot. But nevertheless, we do have a shortage. The Isaka RSA study showed that uh, managers say less of the quarter, uh, less than a quarter of the applicants are actually have the skill sets that they need. Why? Well, they're not curious enough. They're not seeking out the knowledge. They're not doing everything I spoke. 
53% says it takes three to six months to get these people, you know, to the point they're hired, and another several months to get them onboarded. So the process is slow, meaning if it's slow, someone else is going to hire your person away from you. So agility is definitely a problem here for companies, right? And again, a lot of people say that we aren't given the things we need to uh, basically promote our skills opportunity, and the, the work isn't good. Yes, ma'am. Not even close. All the stuff I just talked about, your son, daughter, whomever, should be seeking that out. You should be dragging them here. You should be taking them to local meetings. Right? We'll, we'll get that in a second. And again, uh, retaining talent is a big one here. Um, this is for your, I will post this on SlideShare afterwards, so you guys can download that uh, item, especially those who are interested in getting your kids involved. Um, promoting a work-life balance, and I'm talking about that as well. Uh, it's really up to us to achieve this. If you think your employer is going to do this for you, yeah, you're doing it wrong, man. You're seriously doing it wrong. Okay, so this is a good list, right? Change up assignments. Yeah, we like variety. What else is new? Right. What job? Well, there are a lot of jobs state workers don't really like variety. Um, but again, keep the job interesting. You know, don't don't enforce the ranks. No, it's not your position to say. You really do need to listen to people. That's kind of a new fluffy thing. It's really big in Austin, by the way. Sometimes it's like, e okay, write your idea down, give it to somebody who will actually be able to articulate it. But some people aren't very good at doing that idea. Giving. But this is what keeps people happy. What's the one thing missing from this slide? Don't work for a dick manager. All right. If you don't like your manager, you are in the wrong job. You must have some respect for your manager, if not a lot of respect. But again, I work for him because I respect him, I like him, and he lets me do stuff like this to educate. We're real big on community. I get 10 hours a month to do community, so actually I'm doing community service right now. Uh, it's really good. But again, keeping that talent is important. It's something we should all understand and know. Training. Not saying, don't blow your training wad on the class. Though it is top-notch training, I will not knock the training, I just knock the price. Yes. Yeah, so he says, what if what if you do have a bad boss, but you have to stay at that position in order to move up and get a better boss? That's a decision you'll have to balance and make. Is this a short-term dick boss, as I say? Or is it something that you don't think, you know, you move on? There are people that work for him. They'll want you in that position and not let you out of that position. You're going to have to make that call on yourself. Does the company have that uh, mobility capability? Is there a way for you to apply? Is there a way for him to stomp down on it or her, her to stomp down on it? Um, there's that consideration that occurs. But if at any given time in your industry, with as many jobs that are out there, you run into that roadblock, I suggest you move on. Find another find another gig that's, that's more like it. Yeah. Yeah, two. Yeah. Yeah. Which means don't work for me because I'm a dick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I don't think I'd wear that at work. That didn't go over well. Um but anyway, I, I do like SANS training, don't get me wrong, but I don't like the cost. A lot of us, how many people here have been to a SANS training? All right, how many people here can afford that on their own? Yeah, come see the, see the problem. How many people are here to been to some other training like Hack Miami's training yesterday or a B-Sides or a Derby or see more hands are going up, okay? Or one of my classes. My classes usually are really cheap uh, comparatively. I do our discovery training and basic analysis where then after basic analysis, you do somebody like Chris will take over because it's time-consuming and somebody else or I'll do it when I have time. And I do Windows logging training, duh, Windows logging cheat sheets. Um, but look out for those courses. They're cheaper. All right? Seek out that training and those those items. DerbyCon training is, what, $1,200? These are the same guys doing SANS class, same guys doing Black Hat classes. This training is going to benefit you because you can go to more of them. So you have a choice. Two training classes of two different cons or one SANS course. Nah, two other trainings. Right? If you're going after the GAC, then yes, you would be right. right? You have to decide whether or not you're going to pay that for never-ending GAC dollars. Another problem with that. 
Attend more B-Sides events, seriously. Like Hack Miami isn't a B-Sides event, but it's like that. It's a community event. And again, if someone else is paying, how many people here paid their own sans course? Yeah, okay, see? Someone else is paying, that's why you're going. Um, and again, it's great training. I, I'm not saying it's bad training at all. It's just, unfortunately, budgets are what they are. Budgets are budgets. And seek it out. Look it up. Ask people where the training is. Cert or not to cert. So get to the question of whether or not they should go to school. Um, that is the question. Uh, we poke a lot of fun at certs, uh, but the previous facts show you will need one or more certs. Now, you can't have cert, certain certs, like a CISP needs five years' experience some way, form, or manner. So in that aspect, you'll have to have a job first, and then you will have to get your certification. Um, but again, it really does open the door. The reality is we make fun at these certifications, but they are what HR looks for. They are what high-level managers look for. They may not be the guy who actually you work for is involved, because before the resumes get to them, there's this filter process in companies, and the reality is that's what they're looking at, right? So you will have to do them, unfortunately. I, was a C I am a CISSB. I was a CISA. I let that expire this year, Certified, uh, certified uh, Information Security Auditor. What's that? Yeah. Um, so I let that expire. I haven't audited since I left the state. I don't plan to audit again. Um, and I'm a CISM as well, the management side of it. Um, do your homework. Seek advice of others, depending on what they are. And yeah, 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 CEH and SAN stuff too. Yes? No. All right. So here's my thought about education. I left it out of the slide deck because I didn't want the two to be confused. I wanted it to be more verbal than it was in the slide deck. I think everybody needs to go to school today reason for that is companies, unfortunately, can immediately look at whether or not there's a degree, regardless of there being a certification or skill set. There are exceptions to that, which I'll cover in a sec, but. And how do you know they aren't going to get InfoSec burnout and therefore leave the industry? And now, where are they at? Okay. So I think, unfortunately, today, the young generation really should go to school for the fact of whatever the heck degree they get, hopefully not something like art or archaeology. I finally got to use archaeology. Guess where my degree went? Mao archaeology. I looked for artifacts in the desert. I didn't uh, actually ever get anywhere with it because, you know, no money. So from my perspective, go to school um, and get that degree because you don't know what's going to happen later in your life. And I see a lot of our people dropping out, going on to all kinds of interesting uh, next, next generation jobs, okay? Uh, Correct, but you could go for a basic business degree, or you could go for an accounting degree, or whatever, if you really think auditing is, like, cool. But you could do, right? So you really do should align that degree with something that I call is employable. There's a job, there's a book called Worthless, and it talks about worthless degrees. So look it up. Um, because the U.S. has way too many of them, way too many of them. That means they're unemployable. Get an employable degree, and then, yes, focus at then this stuff second, okay? Or in the process of doing it. Yes. He just wants to them. I can't get him in the back with a hand up. Yes. Helps you be more social for sure. Yes, in the back. Yep. 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 That's the reality. It's true. Uh, the exception to that is, in my case, my last five jobs were from somebody I knew. Whether I had a degree or not was irrelevant. Right, so. Yes, i got to move on. I have 15 minutes. Uh, the ones I listed, well, that was pretty close. The ones I listed uh, were pretty much it. There are there are some specialty, obviously, Sam GX and whatnot. Uh, it depends what you're interested in. So seek them out, talk to your colleagues and people in the con and say, what kind of cert would you be interested in? And you may have to chase that cert, get some experience, and then take the test because you have to have some time on it. So again, 35% uh, of security jobs call for certification, right? 23% of, of IT jobs. So we are much higher cert required than others. 
So that's, that's just the reality of things. So it's your career. You have to manage it. You think or expect your manager or your company to do so for you, you're sadly mistaken. So let's talk tools. Um, there's no such thing as prevention. Just, you know, anybody not agree with that? <laughs> Um, prevention is really reduction, right? It's just a reduction of what's happening. All the bad guys get around all of our tools. If prevention worked, then why would we need all these blinky blue boxes? Detection and response is the future because we can't stop them. Let's detect them. After living this and realizing and watching the Chinese bypass all of our security tools, uh, tipping point, IPSs, tripwire, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yeah, um, they know and buy the same tech we do and know how to get around it. And we should know we cannot stop them. Pen testing is 100% successful, 99% of the time, I think. I, it's rare that a pen tester says, I actually couldn't get into this gig. I was real surprised. Okay. Anybody here not been able to get in as a pen tester? I rest my case. So really get good at detecting so you can stop them before they make Krebs lists, right? Welcome to the future. And you don't want to be on Krebs lists. If you saw my T-shirt from uh, yesterday, I wore, the, or no, I wore the cyber security. Tomorrow I'll wear the Krebs shirt. Free is not free. Open source downloads and everything, yeah, they're free. But they're not people free. And here's actually a, somebody had done a calculation of uh, pop software versus open source, so let's double the cost. Um, but again, have you heard? We uh, lack InfoSec resources. So spending a lot of time in open source, I understand lack of budgets, but um, not necessarily fan um, from that perspective. So my top ten security tools. Any guesses what number one is? Well, log management. <laughs> you, you were pretty much close. Uh, any guesses at number two? <laughs> uh, big fix or equivalent? Uh, no, not the patching part. Number three? Only because I'm biased and I wrote it, but really it does fill the hole. Uh, anybody care to guess what four through ten are? Somebody's going to get this. No. There aren't any. How many up here are security tools, other than the fact that I wrote one with Brian, right? This is what I concluded in my 20 years experience is security tools, yeah, they can bypass them. Uh, Chris can probably validate some of this in regards to malware. I'm starting to see malware that locks binaries. It's a feature in LogMD to look for locked binaries, by the way, um, because the quarantine action of the EDR solutions can't take action on the locked files, so they're already developing the bypasses or ways to get to uh, stay persistent. In no specific order, 11 and on is basically compliance or whatever. Um, doesn't matter after this. Pick one or more tools that you have. Pick Gartner, however your decision is to buy the tools. That's what happens. Okay, You just buy that stuff and you fill it in because you have to. Or you think it fills a gap or it does fill a gap. Um, but really, what makes them the top 10 is they exceed my expectations by well over 100%. When I realized Big Fix allowed me to ask any system in the company a question and return back an answer in less than 15 minutes, and then run a job to rename the file, take ownership of the file, whatever, and, and clean the system up, I was like, oh, this is badass. And then I could say, I'm going to watch this directory in Windows for new DLLs. Oh, and it alerts me on it. That's badass, right? Nothing I had did that. Log management for obvious reasons. Um, but again, they were things that caught the Chinese hackers. This is what we caught the Chinese hackers with, not any of the security tools. Yes. I'll cover that in a sec. Over 50% of us have dissatisfaction with our tools. What the frick, people? Does anybody even test their tools? Uh, the answer is I don't think they're doing a very good job. Uh, we're doing an EDR solution right now, so here's my EDR. If you're doing EDR and you want to know how to test it, take LogMD, infect the box, LogMD it, see what all the malware did, and then do the same thing with the EDR solution and compare the two. It's going to blow your mind. LogMD is way ahead. It just doesn't prevent anything. It's a detective. Um, and that's what our test goes through, right? Are we going to listen to the gardener, salespeople, or whatnot? Seriously, improve your POCs and evaluations. That's what I've learned over the last 20 years. Uh, people generally take the word on it or see some cool features, but when they actually implement the tool, it does not meet their expectations. 50% is pretty bad. So find out they suck sooner so you can pick a better tool. Automation. I am not a fan. Speaking to all of you guys who write Python code for crying out loud. I'm not a fan of hacking tools, whether it's pen testing, infosec, or forensics tools. I have better things to do. We all do. Again, remember that lack of resources from earlier? Uh, please compile your Python code. I am so tired of trying to get somebody's Python code to compile my Python. It's, it's, it's not even funny. 
Um, and it's why LogMD is compiled. You want to be able to deploy it with SSCM, big fix, or whatever, and run it on the box and gather the reports. Right? And have you heard when black people like resources? <laughs> Again. If we don't start automating, we cannot scale. We do not have enough people. You cannot do your job well enough to, you know, you have to automate it so we can basically create more automation to fill the gaps because management keeps looking at this as overhead. Uh, InfoSec people cost serious dollars. Do the math. If you've got a group of 10 people on InfoSec and suddenly you're asking for two more, start doing the math on how much that costs to a company. And what real value are they getting out of us? I know a company that has 100 InfoSec analysts at 100 grand an average or more. Anybody want to do the math there? That company has a serious, you know, that's a big number to the, the executives. And again, uh, even if we save them from a breach or get, get the mandians of the world out quicker, um, they don't really perceive that value, right? Insurance is only valuable when you use it. And now they're buying insurance and we're still working on it. Okay, are we? Um, adding people will not scale. We must start automating people's set. Log management, we suck as an industry. Sorry, uh, we do. Uh, people don't even turn it on locally. Cheat sheets, same logic applies to Linux and, and Mac as well. Yes? Oh, you mean like Anthem, Yahoo, and PCI? They're basically requiring you, from insurance perspective, to be somewhat PCI compliant or equivalent, HIPAA, high tech, high trust, whatever. Yep. Yep. So you're going to be evaluated before you can even get insurance. And so, great, we have people helping the insurance companies out, validate us, all the PSCI work, all the, all the IRS 1075 work, and really we're doing no real security engineering. Um, so, great for that. But, yes, they do require you. Yeah, that's a good point. Insurance might be hiring red teamers. <laughs> uh, yes, we can even catch red teamers with log management, right? It is the number one tool by far because they really can't bork your logs. If you're collecting it off box and they clear the logs, it's still off box. Win NTI, one of the bad Win NTI guys, were definitely multiple actors. This guy would make a bunch of typos and then clear the log. That was stupid. Even Carlos Perez knows how important logging is. Good shout out, friend of mine, ex HP person. Um, he does red teaming and wrote a Metasploit module to look for the stuff in the cheat sheet. Step one again, follow the cheat sheets they, or CIS. Do that. That's how you do good log management. What do I enable is what they answer. And yes, the same logic applies to OSX or Nix. They're just not event codes like Windows. Step two, find a good tool. I don't care if you open source it or whatnot, but again, people is not free. Um, but the tool may be. Splunk is definitely awesome here. LogMD is a standalone tool, no central console. Um, but again, work with the red team to catch what they're logging. If you're a red teamer, uh, definitely log better. And definitely running behind. <laughs> um, this is an example of what we caught in logs NTI breach to give you an idea of why I think it's so valuable. Um, this is everything we found. The cool part is, oops, the cool part is, it led us to the keys based on the command line logging that allowed us to realize that's where they're hiding their code and all the commands and directions they were going and what they were doing. So log management. This is what caught Win NTI in 2014. Big fix or equivalent. So yes, there's others. Google Gur, OS Query, SSCM doesn't matter. Uh, SSCM is not quite the same duck. I need to be able to ask the system a question, whatever tool that may be. Uh, investigator, OS Query, it's not very good on Windows because they actually paid somebody else to compile it. Um, but again, do you have this? Uh, if you do see this, alert me, and then run a job to clean it up. Big Fix is awesome for this. Tanium would be a similar thing. But I'm going to fill the logs with a bunch of PowerShell or DB stuff or whatever because that's what you have to log into. And then LogMD number three because, again, it's a, it's a standalone tool where I can investigate a box rip through these. We can talk about that later. There are three editions. There is a free edition, so please go download the free edition. Uh, one to seven days of log. If you need more than seven days of log, get log management. Uh, we do full file system hashing and registry snapshots. We do large reg keys. We do sticky keys, exploit, null bytes in the registry, list of auto runs, log files, everything us IR people need, it does. Right? And that's why it's my number three tool. Uh, 15 reports for free, 25 reports for pro. 
Uh, you guys can look it up. Um, Shrum is interesting. How many people here know about Shrum? 8.1 and 10. There's one in the back. Yeah, so the statistics of a binary, so whatever.exe, sending bytes in and out. So now I can answer in the six-day period that the Shrum database holds, potentially when the box first got compromised and how many bytes actually left the box. So did I lose any data? And then auto runs, we have a compare feature with let's just chop it down to almost nothing and be able to do it enterprise-wide. So what can you do? Red team versus blue team, a.k.a. purple. I'm not corrupt the level of red team details that are covering blue stuff, right? I see Prezos and they say, okay, great. Uh, look for 2624 20, logins that are not LSAS um, is not enough, right? I need to know that they're not calling TC SEE TCP priv. So if you see a 4624 that's calling some funky binary, um, some name of binary is calling TCP priv, um, then you know you're having a, a request to the database of so credentials, uh, aka Mimicats. Uh, you have to get more specific in your red team talks about blue team details. People in blue team side really need this kind of level of detail, so please do it. And again, use the Windows login sheet sheets. If you're a red teamer, Rod, configure your Windows boxes to do this and then look at your attacks and what it's discovering so you can better teach your engagements what to do. So please, do a better job. Many, team, many say red team is sexy. I say blue team is sexy, right? Red team has to be right once. Uh, Malwareians, on the other hand, also have to be right once. Um, but us blue teamers have to be right all the time. Uh, wait a minute. That'd be right all the time. Not crap. That means my wife's right, right? She's right. So blue team's clearly more challenging because we have to be right all the time, unlike the red teamers. Um, are you up for the challenge as a blue teamer? Are you? Because trust me, it's, it's fun. It's challenging. A lot of late nights. Um, but it, it's good. And personally, I don't think there's anything more sexy than to catch the Chinese and kick them out. I had a ball the day we did that multiple times. I had to add this because of what happened. I just want to cry that all of you are not doing this. So for the love of Spock, please block the incoming malicious known file types in your email gateway so you don't even receive them emails. But also, number one thing, change your Windows, your Windows hosted script engine to Notepad. That way, however the VB script gets in, or the WSF, WSH, all that crap that gets in, when the user gets a Word doc with OLA and some VBS script, they double click it. Deny the double click. It will open a Notepad instead of detonate. This is how 90% or 99% of the malware and, and freaking uh, ransomware stuff's hitting us. We turned this off in our environment, and I am not kidding you, six months, nothing in regards to ransomware. We just completely dropped it. Community. Let's end with community. I was on the ISSA board for one year, besides for six, like I spoke of. Everyone here, including the youngins that are probably in the other room, some of them standing up in the back, um, please get involved with the local community. It's what allows, like Rod is doing for you guys here and the people out there, please hug them and thank them for the work they've done. Um, I know doing B-Sides for six years, Rod uh, ran a CTF one year and has visited us in talks as well. Um, but again, it is something that will definitely advance your career. If I see this on your resume, yeah, guess what? You just bumped up. You floated to the top of the list much quicker. You know, seriously, you can lock and be learned here. It builds relationships, contacts. How do you think Rod and I know each other? He's a red teamer, right? I'm a blue teamer. The two shall not meet. Yes, last section, so I am almost done. And again, serious resume and help enhancement. We need your help. Please volunteer. Please, 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 please. And you will have to mentor. Uh, hopefully what I'm doing here, giving you some ideas. Uh, again, people are looking to move positions. Uh, the young ones, the wannabes, the noobs, they need our mentoring. They need our skills. You need to get them under your arm. Women, too. Mentor more women because, again, they bring a completely different mindset to our groups. They can accomplish things we can't, maybe just because of personality. But there's a lot of work here. Uh, we have one in Austin now that's setting up shop. Uh, you watch out for what she's doing. She's got some great stuff going on. We talked about kids. We definitely want to mentor the kids. They need help in the colleges. Okay? Like she asked, this is a common problem that all of us are responsible to help out with. Whether you do the Cyber Patriot Program, which would be my recommendation, by the way, is a school that does CCDC. So, yes, we can get to that point. Um, get them interested. Uh, I tried to get into my local high school right across the street from my house where my daughter went to school, and they're like, nope, sorry, not interested because you're not part of the curriculum. That's just sad. you have any idea what I can do? Come in here and show you some of the cool hackery I do? Yeah. Um, that's a bummer. We have to break that gap, whether it's Cyber Patriot or anybody else. And, again, remember the 80-20 thing. Um, you know, again, blue team is 80% of the jobs, and, again, we have to make sectors challenge. Last but not least, burnout. This is an issue. Try fighting the Chinese regularly. Boy, I would burn out. It is eventually why I left because the manager kept opening up a whole
hole, which is how they end up compromising the game and stuff again. So, yeah, I get tired of stupidity. Um, but again, we have to balance our lives. And no one can do that but you. All of you have to balance your own life. Okay? I mountain bike. I used to race. There's my medals. There's me at Slip Rock in Moab. Rod here actually is a DJ. Okay? We all have to find something non-techy outside of this. I do the contours. To me, that is not... Uh, that's not my job part. That's something that I enjoy, teaching, sharing, etc. Remember, that community thing. Um, so it is up to you in regards to burnout. With that, the resources, you can get the stuff at malwarearchaeology.com. The tool can be found at logmd, log-md.com. I will be around. Let's talk. Let's bring up some of these things we talked about. Let's answer some of the questions about getting the kids in school. Um, let's share. There's lots of people here that can share, I'm sure. And if you want to share, go seek out one of the kids you see and start bringing up a conversation. Unless you're a red teamer, just stay away from the kids. We don't want to poison them. <laughs> and with that, I uh, take any questions offline since we're a little behind. Please ask me questions. I'm here to share. And I do have more thumb drives than I see in one hand. Yes, I see lots of hands. <laughs> they will be on SlideShare and also through malwarearchaeology.com under resources. There's presentations. You'll see the link there. Thank you.